Hi and welcome. Today we're going to talk about the statement of facts section of a motion or brief that you would file in court. Before you watch this video, you should make sure that you have reviewed the materials from the lawsuit Wang versus IMDB, because I'm going to be relying heavily on those materials in this video. And also, please keep in mind that I've made a, a number of changes to the materials from that lawsuit uh, just for the purposes of this video um, for pedagogical reasons. So first, what are the purposes of the facts section of a motion or brief? There are two main things that you need to do. First, one of the purposes is to summarize the factual record that is relevant to the motion or brief you're filing. Second, the facts section is your opportunity to start persuading the court that your position is the right one. So first we're going to look at some nuts and bolts of how to draft the facts section. And then I'm going to walk you through some techniques you can use to make your facts section persuasive. So the nuts and the bolts. Where does the facts section or statement of facts go? Ordinarily, the statement of facts comes immediately after the introduction. So here, you can see that's where the facts is, immediately after the introduction on the same page. There are exceptions to this. There are some kinds of motions where a court might have other rules about where it wants the statement of facts. Sometimes if you're drafting a motion for summary judgment or opposition to mo a motion for summary judgment, you would actually have a separate document called a statement of facts in dispute or a statement of facts not in dispute. Uh, those are unique situations um, th that are beyond the scope of this video. Uh, so I'm going to really just talk you through what you would do in most circumstances. Okay, let's also keep in mind that you can and often should use subheadings within your facts to divide a lengthy facts section into different pieces. So generally, what information do you need to include in the facts section? First, you need to include all of those facts that are relevant to your, your, your legal argument. Any fact that you mention anywhere in your argument section needs to be in your statement of facts. Second, you need to provide any other additional background facts that are necessary or helpful context. Remember that you are often reducing a very large record to a set of manageable information that is relevant to this particular motion you're filing. So you might be filing a motion for summary judgment in which there were 20 depositions taken, um, and each deposition transcript is 60 or 70 or 80 pages, and there might have been thousands of documents produced in discovery. Your job is to uh, reduce that record to just those facts the court needs to decide the motion that you're bringing or the, the motion that you're opposing. Conversely, sometimes your statement of facts will be very short because you want to focus on just those facts the court needs for the motion. If the motion, for example, is a discovery motion, it may be that your statement of facts only has a couple of sentences that are about the background uh, lawsuit and then has several paragraphs that describe the specific factual dispute that gave rise to the discovery uh, problem. So you would not in that circumstance want to spend much time describing the underlying legal dispute if the, the concern of the motion is just about the discovery dispute between the uh, parties, for example. Okay, so you should, however, make sure that you tell the entire story that the judge needs, regardless of whether you are bringing the motion or opposing the motion. Notice, for example, that in Wang versus IMDB, both parties begin by describing and introducing who the parties are, even though the party opposing the motion for summary judgment um, can assume that the judge has just read the moving party's documents and already knows who the parties are. You generally want your facts section to tell the whole story, and you also want to use the opportunity to um, introduce the parties and frame who the parties are in a way that helps you. So you should not simply assume that the court has already read the other side's motion and is now um, doesn't need any information from you about who the parties are. It's kind of disjointing to jump into a statement of facts that sort of assumes that from the beginning. So tell the complete story, regardless of whether you are bringing the motion or opposing the other side's motion. And finally, one other um, background sort of nuts and bolts to keep in mind is that you want to cite to the record throughout the facts section. Just about every sentence in the statement of facts should have a cite to the record. So here, for example, is a paragraph from IMDB's facts section in its motion. Notice every sentence has, at the end, a cite to the record, and in some places, cites to multiple parts of the record. And 
you want to cite with precision. If you're citing to a declaration, you cite to the specific paragraph of the declaration that the relevant material appears in. If you're citing to a deposition, notice that you cite to the specific page and line numbers of the deposition on which the material appears. Now, the blue book can give you details on what format to use in citing to those kinds of materials. If you are filing a motion to dismiss, your facts section might cite only to the complaint because that's really the entire record for a motion to dismiss. But for a motion for summary judgment, you have a lot more material and you want to cite to it properly. One other thing I want to note, which is that for the rest of this video, I have taken the cites out of the examples you're going to see on the screen. And I've done that because I think it will make it easier for you to focus on the text and for me to fit all the text I want you to see on the screen. But I want you to remember that in the actual version that you would file, the each uh, statement or portion of statement of facts that you see would have cites to the record after just about every sentence. So that's the nuts and the bolts. Now, how do you create a fact section that is that persuades, that is effective in introducing uh, the record to the judge. So let's talk about some general techniques. First, you want to organize to persuade. Now this can mean a lot of different things depending on um, what the, the record contains. Sometimes it's most helpful simply to present the facts in chronological order. But if the facts that occur at the beginning of the chronological timeline are bad for your side, you might want to think about how you can reorganize to move those facts down so that the first thing the court reads is not something that's really, really bad for you. Conversely, um, if there are some really, really good facts that occur sort of later in the timeline than at the beginning, you might want to think about how to reorganize to surface those good facts early. Whatever you do, though, I encourage you to think about and maybe make a list of the really good facts and the really bad facts at the beginning in your notes um, because that might trigger some ideas in your head about how to organize uh, to persuade. Next, you want to try to humanize your client. Usually this means um, explaining the reasons, the things that motivated your client to do the things it did. It's especially important if your client is not an individual but is a business or a government agency or organization or other kind of entity to find ways to humanize uh, your client, often, for example, by focusing on what the individual employees of your client, for example, did and why they did it. Later on in this video, we'll look at an example of, of how you can do that. Okay, so other general things you want to do when you are creating a persuasive set of facts. You want to avoid stating legal conclusions. So here's an example. Um, so remember or keep in mind that one of the arguments that IMDB is making um, in its motion is that uh, Ms. Wang has unclean hands. That's a legal doctrine, the doctrine of unclean hands. And IMDB is relying on that as one of its arguments, of the arguments that it makes. So it would not want to say this in its statement of facts for its motion. Juni Wang has unclean hands because of her multiple misrepresentations to IMDB about her age. That's making a statement of a legal conclusion. What IMDB would want to do instead is to, in its statement of facts, um, put together those facts that will enable it to make the argument in its argument section that Ms. Wang has unclean hands. So here's how it might go about doing that. Juni Wang admitted in her deposition that she made multiple misrepresentations to IMDB about her age. First, Huang admitted that she supplied a false birth year when she initially submitted information for her profile in June 2004, and she admits that she claimed falsely to have had to have a birth certificate to support that birth year, and then maybe IMDb has more facts that it wants to include. The idea here is that it's not saying she has unclean hands. Instead, it's, it's providing those facts that it's going to then use and draw on in its argument section later in the motion to make the argument about unclean hands. One thing you might do is to make sure that you avoid using any legal terminology in your statement of facts. And that's true even where you've got legal terms that also have a lay meaning. So if, for example, uh, you're representing, um, uh, maybe, maybe you're a government attorney who has 
uh, defending a lawsuit that alleges an equal protection violation based on some, some statute that Congress has passed. And your argument is that Congress had a rational basis for passing this law. Now, the words rational basis have a lay meaning that many people would understand, but they also have a very clear um, legal doctrinal meaning that is relevant to the lawsuit. So in your statement of facts, you don't want to argue that, um, uh, you don't want to say that Congress had a rational basis for passing the law. Rather, you would want to use your statement of facts to detail all of the specific reasons that Congress passed the law. You would probably rely on a lot of the testimony that Congress heard in its hearings and things like that. And then that sets you up to make the argument in your argument section that Congress had a rational basis. Okay. Another um, technique that you should use in your facts section to make them persuasive is show, don't tell. What does that mean? It means you generally want to avoid using adverbs and adjectives to do the work of the facts themselves. So here's an example that Juni Huang could have put in her motion. And this would be the, the wrong way, include a fact about IMDB's reliance on her credit card information to uh, identify who she was and what her date of birth was. Defendants falsely told this court that they did not use Wang's payment information to obtain Wang's birth date and update the IMDB website. So why do I say that this is the wrong way to include this fact? Well, when, def when you say defendants falsely told this court something, you're using the word falsely, an adverb, to convince the court that defendants actually did something that was false. A more effective way to introduce this fact would be to do something like this. In their motion to dismiss, Defendants told this court that they denied using credit card information to obtain Wang's birth date. However, in his deposition, defendant's representative admitted they used the, quote, billing details from the system IMDB uses to process payment, end quote, to obtain Wang's real name and then use that information to search for her real birth date. What this does is this puts the facts before the court that will hopefully lead the judge to conclude that the defendants falsely told the court that they didn't use Ms. Wong's payment information. But you have, you have provided the facts um, instead of trying to convince the court using the adjective or the adverb falsely. One technique you can use is to go to, to make sure that your facts are persuasive in this way is to go through your facts and ask yourself if the other side would have to agree with every statement you made. If there's a way for the defendants to disagree, it may be that are trying to use adverbs and adjectives to do the work of the actual facts themselves. Okay, so now I wanna talk about uh, techniques for handling the good facts, the stuff that you really wanna emphasize and play up um, in, your, in your statement of facts to make them persuasive. And there are several techniques you can use. The first one is to really draw out and provide a lot of rich detail about those facts you want to emphasize. So, for example, in Juni Huang's motion, one of the facts that she really plays up and wants to emphasize a lot is how, um, what lengths she has gone to to keep her actual age private. And she provides a lot of detail on that. She starts towards the very beginning of her facts section with a statement that says this, Wang estimates that before this lawsuit, only five people, other than her immediate family, government agencies, and payroll companies, knew her legal name. And then she has a couple other things in her statement of facts before she comes back to three paragraphs with a lot of detail on the lengths to which she goes to keep her age private. She says, Wang never tells anyone other than close friends and family her actual age. She doesn't disclose it on her website, resume, or professional correspondence. When she's asked her age, she doesn't answer or, or responds that she's in her 30s. She hasn't told her own agent. She um, initially evaded the question when her agent asked. Then she goes into even more detail about how she avoids providing information about her age. She says her caution extends to every aspect of her life. She opts out of posting her birth date on any social networking sites like Facebook, where she's required to disclose a birth date. To use a service, she generally uses an obviously fictitious entry, for example, claiming she was 99 on her MySpace page. She avoids joining any publicly available group that would allow someone to deduce how old she is, such as a high school class networking site. And then the kicker, even IMDB was unable to determine her birth date until it promised her that it would maintain her personal information in confidence. So in the motion, Ms. Wong could have just said in her statement of facts, 
that she goes to great lengths to keep her, her, her age private and then cited to a bunch of the different places in the record where some of this detail appears. But because these facts are so helpful to the story that she wants to tell, she instead goes through all of this uh, detail to really play up those good facts. Here's another technique you can use. Use short sentences to emphasize facts that you want to really pop. And in fact, interspersing short sentences with longer sentences will make those short sentences, those key facts, pop even more. So here's an actual example from, um, again, from Miss Wang's motion. And this is about uh, her, part of her description of age discrimination in Hollywood. So she starts with a short seven word sentence. Most working actors are not highly paid. Then she has two uh, longer sentences. And unfortunately for actors who spend years building their careers, youth is king in the entertainment industry. There are far fewer characters over age 40 than there are younger roles. Then we have a slightly shorter sentence. Even older characters are regularly played by younger actors. Then another very short seven word sentence. The problem is especially severe for women. This sentence really brings to mind not just age discrimination, but the way gender discrimination is where the problem's even worse. And then we have another longer sentence at the end. There are a few character roles for female performers in their 40s and 50s because roles for women are generally for the young. So here, by interspersing those short sentences with longer ones, the fact that appears in the short sentence stands out more. So here's another technique you can use to emphasize good facts. If you have a really good fact that comes from the other side's material, from the deposition of the other party, um, or from a document the other side produced, you want to explicitly attribute that fact to the other side in the fact section. You could, for example, use language like this. If you're the defendant, you might say, in her deposition, plaintiff admitted, and then describe the admission. So here are some things that IMDB actually uses in its motion. Huang admits that she created the phony passport to dupe IMDB into publishing a false birth date. Note that IMDB could have simply written the sentence this way. Huang created the phony passport to dupe IMDB into publishing a false birth date. But by starting out by saying that Huang admits that she created the phony passport and then citing to that part of her deposition, um, IMDB is emphasizing that this fact that is helpful to IMDB comes directly from Huang's deposition. Similarly, IMDB says this. Wang admits that she has no way of knowing whether she did not get a particular role because of IMDb's actions. Again, really emphasizing that this is um, an admission that the other side made in, that she made in her deposition. Okay, one more technique when you have really good facts. Sometimes it's the absence of facts that you wanna to point to as being helpful. So here's an example from IMDb's motion. Wang estimates that she has experienced a 50% decrease in auditions, but did not provide any evidence of her assertion. So you're pointing out that there is an absence of evidence to support her claim that she experienced a 50% decrease. Similarly, you could do something like this. Nothing in the record suggests that those casting directors rejected Wang because of her age. Again, pointing out an absence of evidence as something that is helpful to your argument. And of course, when you're pointing to an absence of evidence, there's not really um, anything in the record you can cite to, and so that's okay. But you should just make sure that the other side would not be able to come back and cite to actual evidence that undermines the statement you made. So that's how to deal with good facts. What about bad facts, facts that help the other side um, or hurt your argument. So first you have to decide whether you include them at all. If the facts are legally relevant, the answer is yes. You absolutely have to include all the legally relevant facts, whether they're bad or good. What if they're not legally relevant, but they're things that the other side raises or uses to tell its story or to support its arguments? Then you have a decision to make. You need to make a strategic decision about whether it is helpful to you to try to uh, bring in and address those facts and um, dilute their significance using some of the techniques I'm about to show you. So sometimes, if, you are, if you're the party bringing the initial motion, it's a harder decision to make because you're not entirely sure what facts the other side's going to raise and how they're going to use them. Uh, if you're opposing a motion, you already know what facts the other side raised, and you may have a sense of which ones are ones that you want to address, even if they are not directly legally relevant. Keep in mind that it's also sometimes helpful um, to um, omit those facts that are not legally relevant because doing so emphasizes that they're not legally relevant. So for example, 
Um, Miss Wong, in her motion, has a whole section in her facts, in her statement of facts, about age discrimination in Hollywood. And she includes a lot of background facts on age discrimination in Hollywood. IMDb doesn't mention those facts at all. And in leaving them out, IMDb is, is sort of subtly suggesting that age discrimination in Hollywood is irrelevant to whether plaintiff has a valid claim against IMDb for publishing her information. Okay. So once you've made the decision that you need to include bad facts, how can you use them to persuade or at least not undermine the persuasive impact of your argument? So first let's look at an example from IMDb's, uh, actually this is an example where I'm going to show you from, from uh, both sides motions. So remember earlier I said that one of the things you want to do with good facts is provide a lot of rich detail and play up those facts. Conversely, for bad facts, you usually want to handle them in a much more cursory way. So let's look at how the two sides handle the fact that Miss Wong um, submitted a false birth date to IMDb. That's a fact that's obviously bad for Miss Wong and good for IMDb. So IMDb, in its motion, provides um, a fair amount of detail about that fact. Here's what IMDb says. On June 16th, 2004, using her friend Greg Carter's account, Huang submitted biographical information about herself to be included on her IMDb profile. Huang knowingly supplied a false date of birth in 1978 and misrepresented that a birth certificate supported that date. Based on this submission, IMDb posted the 1978 birth date on Huang's IMDb profile. For the next three years, Wang regularly checked her IMDb profile and frequently submitted new information for inclusion, but never attempted to correct the inaccurate date of birth. So we get a lot of detail, four pretty lengthy sentences that really kind of go step by step through um, the submission of this inaccurate birth date. Here's what Ms. Wang says in her motion about that fact. Later, Wang entered a 1978 birth date as an attempt to flesh out her acting persona's biographical details. One sentence presented in a pretty neutral way with a little bit of the motivation behind her entering that date kind of thrown in. Very short and cursory. Okay, so what else can you do when you have a bad fact that you need to include? Um, another good technique is to juxtapose bad facts with good facts, preferably in the very same sentence. So one fact that is bad for IMDb is that it actually does seem like it used information from uh, Ms. Wong's payment, her credit card information, uh, to, to figure out who, what her actual identity was and then to use that to find her birth date. So IMDb has to include that. It's a legally relevant fact. Um, it could have said this in its facts section. IMDb did use Wong's payment information to determine her identity and then find her true birth date. So, that's not a terrible way of presenting that information, but a better approach would be to include in this sentence a good fact that juxtaposes or explains the bad fact. So here's what IMDb could have done. Uh, while IMDb did use Wong's payment information to determine her identity and find her birth date, that was only in response to Wong's 13 requests that IMDb investigate its files for information on her true birth date. Another approach would be to do something like this. Again, starts out the same way. While IMDb did use Wong's payment information to determine her identity, it found her birth date, the only information it posted on its website, in a public database. So here, IMDb is presenting the fact it used, that, that it used her payment information to identify her, but then it's juxtaposing that with the fact that it actually, the only thing it published was from a, a public website. Okay, one final technique for dealing with bad facts, provide context for bad facts. So let's look again at how IMDb handles the fact that it does seem that it used at least some of her payment information to help it figure out what her actual birth date was. So here's what IMDb actually says. First, it starts with this um, information. From September 2007 to November 2008, Wong contacted IMDb 13 times requesting that it remove the 1978 birth date, which she herself submitted, from her IMDb profile. And as an aside, note here that it emphasized, it has that word, that, that phrase 13 times. This is an example of, of showing and not telling, which is good. IMDb doesn't say that Wong contacted them many times. It actually has the specific number. Okay, 
After it says this, IMDb then has a lot of detail on the good facts for its side. Um, I'm not going to include that here. It's in the materials, the background materials that I've provided. But uh, IMDb goes into a lot of detail about those 13 requests and actually quotes at length from some of the email messages Ms. Wong sent. After it's done all that, it's now ready to introduce that bad fact. In response to Wong's repeated requests, IMDb's customer service manager conducted his own research to verify that the original submission was correct. Upon searching public records online, he was unable to verify a date of birth for Jun Wang. Continuing his efforts to assist Wang and responding to Wang's own request that IMDb review its files, he looked up Wang's IMDb account information in IMDb's IPS database. That's its payment database. So remember when I said that one of your goals is to humanize your customer, uh, sorry, humanize your client, and here, your client, um, IMDb is a company. What this paragraph does is it um, focuses on the actions of one employee of IMDb, the customer service manager, and explains his uh, the reason that he took the acts he did. He acted in response to Wong's repeated requests. He acted because he was continuing his efforts to assist Wong. So what this does is it takes that bad fact that IMDb did pull some of her payment information to identify her and explains it not as some nefarious desire to out her actual age, but rather as uh, the, the honest and helpful attempt of the customer service manager to be helpful to her in response to her multiple requests. Okay, so uh, I know I've gone over a lot of specific techniques here. I'm just gonna list them for you so you have them all in one place um, as you are working on your own statements of fact. So what are your techniques? Tell a story, tell your client's story humanize your client, organize uh, thoughtfully, avoid stating legal conclusions, show, don't tell, um, that's also called editorializing when you try to just use adjectives and adverbs to make your argument instead of the actual facts, use the actual facts. For good facts, use lots of detail, attribute good stuff, that the facts that help you to the other side where you can. Um, oh. One thing I didn't mention earlier, direct quotes from the record where they are helpful to you can actually be really effective. So when we talk about um, drawing on material from court opinions, um, you, you may have heard that you should, you should um, resist the urge to do a lot of direct quotes, and that's true. When you are drawing information from the record, from deposition testimony, it's often helpful to use direct quotes, especially where you've got a great piece of information that comes directly from the other side's deposition, for example. For bad facts, a cursory neutral description, uh, juxtapose the bad stuff with the good stuff, preferably in the very same sentence, and provide context where you can uh, for those bad facts. And that's pretty much it. So there's actually a lot more out there about how to draft a persuasive and effective fact statement. This is enough to get you started, and if you're interested in learning more, you should talk to your professor.